Until the 20th century, the sermon was the most frequently composed and widely heard form of public discourse. Yet it's been surprisingly neglected as a historical and a theological source. In this talk, I'm going to discuss what we can learn about the past by studying sermons. And in order to do this, I'm going to focus on one particular form that was very popular in the 19th century, the village sermon. Among the many bound volumes of printed sermons which survive from the Victorian era, it appears that the largest discrete category is that of the village sermon. There were other significant categories, parish sermons, university and public school sermons, cathedral sermons, visitation sermons, but village sermons appear to trump them all. Numerous collections of village sermons steadily rolled off the presses from the 1820s to the early years of the 20th century. Their authors were largely, though not exclusively, Anglican clergymen, and they spoke from every theological perspective, from the premillennial to the advanced Tractarian. This homiletic genre was remarkably popular and well understood during the 19th century by preachers, by publishers, and by the purchasers of printed sermon collections. Yet, in common with much else about 19th century preaching, it has been totally neglected since. What was it about publishing sermons addressed to villagers that preachers found so compelling? And how did they visualise their village? What did they expect of the villagers? And how did they approach them? How were village sermons typically constructed? How did preachers use the Bible? And what reference did they make to Christian themes and the seasons of the church's year? These are all interesting questions. In this talk, I shall look at just three of those questions. First, who published village sermons and when? Second, what was the mysterious allure which the village had for 19th century preachers? And third, how did preachers use the Bible, moral exhortation and the lectionary? My study is based on a sample of 150 volumes of village sermons located from the British Library catalogue that were published between 1804 and 1906. In order to qualify for inclusion in the sample, the volume of sermons had to have the words village or country in its title, and it had to be a collection of such sermons. No single items were included. In most cases, the author is identifiable, and in all cases where the author is identified, he is the sole author of the entire volume. No edited collections of village sermons from multiple authors have been discovered. The sample includes some anonymous works, such as 12 plain sermons preached in a village church from 1833, and plain sermons for country people by a clergyman from 1862. The criteria for inclusion being the words village and country in the title. The rigid insistence on a narrow range of titles filtered out the numerous collections of plain or parochial sermons which also exist, but which are not overtly directed at village audiences. It also excluded collections of sermons which were described as, pre as preached in the village of X, when X would have been considered a village at the time of preaching. Thus, the 150 volumes analysed in my sample are, are undoubtedly an underestimate of the true number of what were considered village sermons that were printed in the 19th century. They constitute a comprehensive, but not a complete survey. The definition of what qualified as a village sermon was made deliberately narrow in order to prevent the sample from becoming an amorphous collection of parish preaching in which the focus on the rural communi community of the village was obscured. So my first question is, 
who published village sermons? And the answer is that Anglican clergymen of all types published collections of village sermons. It was not associated with any particular churchmanship or ministerial pattern. Some clergy prepared their village sermons for publication at a very early stage in their career. In the case of the pre-millenarian evangelical Alexander Dallas, just a year after his ordination, and in the case of George Butler, who is better known later as the husband of the social reformer Josephine Butler, just three years after his ordination. Among those who, unlike Dallas, are presumed not to have been imminently expecting the second coming, it was more common to wait. Clergy might reasonably expect to gain experience in their rural parishes and to hone their sermons on their congregations as well as in the study before rushing into print. It was also very common for a volume of village sermons to be assembled by a relative and published a year or so after the preacher's death, both as an epitaph to his time in rural ministry and as evidence of his ability to communicate clearly, something which, as we shall see, was very highly regarded. In analysing village sermons, it is important to appreciate that the date of publication is not indicative of when the material was preached. Thus, R. W. Church died in 1890, and his village sermons were published in three volumes between 1892 and 1897, with a later edition in 1913. But the sermons originated in his Somerset parish of Waitley between 1853 and 1871. And within this date range, it is impossible to know when they were created. Similarly, Thomas Arnold died in 1842, and in 1878, his, his daughter published the sermons which he had preached in the Surrey parish of Laleham in the 1820s. In fact, some of his village sermons had been available earlier, but she decided to publish them again systematically for a fresh class of readers, as she put it, believing them to have retained their freshness and force over the intervening half century. It's only occasionally possible to pin down a village sermon to a particular time of writing or preaching, which makes it harder to make generalisations about changing styles of preaching as the decades pass. Well-known clergy had little difficulty in seeing their works into print in the 19th century, and many of the authors of village sermons were well-known. Of the 99 named individual authors in my sample, 29 are included in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. The fact that the genre was favoured by men of all ecclesiastical standpoints, or their executors, is easy to see. Famous evangelical authors of village sermons were Thomas Scott and T.R. Burks. The broad churchmen included Thomas Arnold and J.W. Colenso. Moderate high churchmen were John James Blunt and Thomas Thorpe, and the Tractarians included John Keeble and R. W. Church. Other very well-known authors of village sermons were Sidney Smith and Charles Kingsley, and among top-ranking theologians may be noted F. D. Morris, B. F. Westcott, and F. J. A. Hort. Several more, like Thomas Kirchhofer Arnold, Edward Behrens, and Charles Hartley, were reasonably prolific authors who were well known in the church of their day, although they've been seldom remembered since. Some are today principally known as hymn writers, such as Henry Alford and Sabine Baring Gould. Nevertheless, about two thirds of the sample is composed of parish clergy whose lives remain fairly obscure. And a few were well known nonconformist ministers such as the independent George Birder and the Baptist Jabez Burns. 22 volumes of village sermons in the sample were published in the 1820s as the trickle turned into more of a torrent. Sermons preached before a country congregation was a title much favoured at this period with authors and publishers seemingly indifferent to the fact that other works were appearing with identical or almost identical titles. <laughs>
something which seemed of little consequence for the next 80 years. Edward Behrens, who became one of the early specialists in village preaching, published the first of his seven collections anonymously in 1820. Thomas Scott's executors produced village discourses composed from notes of sermons preached at Aston Sanford in 1825. Scott had served Aston Sanford in Buckinghamshire from 1801 until his death in 1821 and had belonged very much to the world of 18th century evangelicalism. As the title makes clear, the sermons were reconstructed from the notes of his hearers. He had not left his sermon material neatly with the intention that it should be brought to publication. Most of the other authors from this decade come within the category of obscure clergy, indicating that it was a genre that was developed by ordinary country clerics and then adopted by the more famous rather than the other way round. Village sermons continued to be published at a steady rate until the early years of the 20th century. The 1850s was a particularly prolific decade, seeing the publication of 28 of the volumes in the sample. It was also the decade when the majority of the British population began to live in towns for the first time, when public health reached an all-time crisis, and when for many, the village was becoming more of a memory or even an imagined community rather than a reality. In the second half of the century, the output began to slow, but only very gradually. 17 volumes were published in the 1860s, 11 in the 1870s, 15 in the 1880s, and 14 in the 1890s. Now I'm going to turn to the second part of my talk. What was the allure of the village? To a greater extent than is often appreciated, the idea of the village parish burned brightly in the mental world of the 19th century Anglican cleric, and it continued to burn brightly even as Britain accelerated into an urban and a suburban transformation. Should we interpret the continuing enthusiasm for village sermons as a sign of dogged refusal to take note of these changes and of a desire to retreat into the nostalgic evocation of small-scale compliant communities where dissenters were few, free thinkers were unthought of, and the vicar was perceived as the king of all he surveyed. It's impossible to escape entirely from this conclusion. On the other hand, as I have argued elsewhere, the extent to which much of 19th century Britain continued to remain rural tends to be overlooked, and country churches continue to provide a loud heartbeat for Anglican experience. With this in view, the continuing market for village sermons becomes more explicable. Clerical experience at the fin du siècle was as much about wondering how the century's finest theologians had communicated the gospel in their ordinary parishes as it was about being shocked by Oscar Wilde or the new woman who wanted divorce on demand. Moreover, few village sermons were dependent for their success on the rurality of the location they could equally well be read profitably by those preaching in towns or cities. The 1850s saw a sharpening of interest among clergy in the life of the village. Not only, as, as we have seen, was it the peak decade for the publication of village sermons, but it also witnessed the rapid spread of harvest festivals and the publication of material designed to advise clergy on how to deal with some of the associated developments. For example, John Thomas's How Shall the Parish Feast Be Dealt With? Vastly ambitious in its conception of what a clergyman should do in his country parish was the anonymously written Village Development Based on Practical Principles or The Old Vicar's Advice, published in 1854. It was couched in the form of an extended letter from a self-described old vicar to a young priest setting out on a rural incumbency. 
The opening advice on how he should conduct the services was unremarkable enough. Be punctual, don't mumble, avoid wearing creaky shoes. But it was the, in the lengthy section on the village that the work moved into a different realm. The author advised the young priest that he should consider the village as your farm. It should be your business to improve it in every possible way towards what your ideas of a model village should be. Many of the instructions which followed related to improving the physical appearance of the village. For example, using, it, using the parsonage garden to grow plants which could be given to parishioners to fill window boxes, keeping a supply of paint for them to use for decorating and advising them to move the manure heap away from the cottage door. Clearly influenced by Prince Albert's model cottages at the Great Exhibition of 1851, the author advised the priest to commission the village carpenter to make some cheap and useful furniture and then to make a sort of little exhibition so that the parishioners could see and gradually adopt the furniture. For example, replacing huge and unhygienic curtained bedspreads, bedsteads with neat, smaller beds with built-in chests of drawers. Rather than merely advising parishioners on how to improve their homes, the priest had to set up a range of village institutions and services. These should include a village library with tea room attached, a playground and park, village allotments, village shows for flowers, vegetables and poultry, a parish savings bank, an emigration fund, a charity shop, presumably for the disposal of all that bulky furniture, a lodging house, a temperance hotel, a village hospital, and a public kitchen, building on the already common institution of the public bakehouse. Careful instructions are provided on how each of these facilities should be established and managed, although very little is said about how they should be paid for and how the priest should handle objectors or vested interests. A somewhat vaguely constituted monthly meeting of parishioners is envisaged, which will, and I quote, also be in some measure your fund and security in monetary arrangements. The clergyman is not expected to do more out of his own pocket than give a moderate subscription. Well, the anonymous nature of this publication means that it is sadly impossible to link it with any particular parish in order to assess the extent to which its author succeeded in practicing what he preached. It's not clear whether there ever was a village exactly like the one described, or whether it was an extended fantasy on what would be desirable in an ideal world. But whether or not it was all true is beside the point. What the book reveals is the allure which the English village held in the mid-19th century clerical imagination and the possibilities which it was thought to hold for instilling social harmony and material well-being. Nor was it all hopelessly idealistic. There were many parishes in which at least one or two similar schemes were successfully put into practice. For example, at Fenny Compton, Charles Hartley successfully organised a small company to provide a proper water supply. And at Eversley, Charles Kingsley established a lending library, ran, and ran adult education classes on three nights a week. And he also ran several parish savings schemes and doled out bread and soup. What is striking, however, is the extent to which the clergyman is placed so firmly at the centre of the village. A benevolent autocrat retaining his ancient status as the only educated gentleman in the community. The motto at the front of the book, to the effect that men are simply boys grown big, a sentiment which is repeated in the text, tends to reinf reinforce the infantilizing of the male villages, villagers and the distance between them and their modern omnicompetent parson. For, village, for Anglican clergy, like the prolific village sermon writer Edward Behrens, the village represented the ideal community in which all the inhabitants are, as he put it, 
admitted into the Church of Christ by the same common baptism, meeting together in the same sacred edifice for public worship and walking in the house of God as friends. The ideal of unity is a factor in explaining the popularity of village sermons, although the reality of religious difference at this date could not be ignored. Behrens went on to insist on the duty of obedience to the parish minister and to compare schism in a parish when its inhabitants are split into religious parties, some choosing one teacher and some another, some resorting to church and others to a meeting house as being reminiscent of the church at Corinth. Well, now I come to my third section, which is on the use of the Bible and moral exhortation. All of the sermons that I studied were linked to a biblical text, which was printed at the beginning. But the manner in which the sermon writers used their portion of scripture varied considerably. Many writers may, may be located somewhere on a spectrum which had biblical exposition at one end and moral exhortation at the other. Those at the biblical exposition end of the spectrum spent the bulk of their sermon discussing what the text might mean, how the characters involved might have reacted, and how other parts of the Bible might shed further light on the matter. They tended to intersperse this with fairly brief passages of application. Meanwhile, those at the moral exhortation end of the spectrum tended to spend much of their sermons issuing warnings about the eternal fate of the lost and urging their hearers and readers to repentance, faith and good behaviour. They tended to use the chosen text as little more than a garnish or a motto, a hook which allowed them to move very rapidly into moral teaching, although sometimes they would pile on other but unrelated scriptural references. Most preachers were somewhere in the middle of this spectrum, interspersing observations about the Bible with observations about the temptations and shortcomings of 19th century people. And they moved quickly back and fro, from sinful behaviour in the Bible to sinful behaviour in the local community and then pointing to virtuous behaviour among biblical characters as an exemplar for the congregation's own conduct. The balance tended to vary very much from sermon to sermon. Those who were, or who were destined to become, professors tended towards the biblical exposition end of the spectrum. B.F. Westcott and F.J.A. Hort their minds, steeped in biblical scholarship, evoked the, wor the worlds of the Old and New Testaments easily and interestingly. And once they had evoked them, there they tended to stay for the duration of the sermon. Indeed, Hort was vastly happier in the world of first century Palestine than he ever was in his Hertfordshire parish of St. Ippolitz, where he preached from 1857 to 1872 with a two-year pause when he had a breakdown. But although he is reckoned to have struggled to express himself in the pulpit, in printed form his sermons are lucid, on the assumption that, as contemporary works on homiletics state, the Bible's major themes and language were well known among mid-19th century rural people, Hort's sermons would have been encouraging and thought-provoking rather than baffling. He pointed out Old Testament allusions and parallel texts. He carefully explained what words in Hebrew and Greek might mean and that they might have other meanings than those conveyed in the English of the King James Version. And he drew out alternative readings. He tried to come up with striking local analogies. On one occasion explaining how different the tribes of Israel were from the county set existing in Hertfordshire and neighbouring counties. He always deployed scholarship in ways which were intended to be relevant to his audience, 
This may be clearly seen in the text he took for his first sermon at St Hippolyte's, which was Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, in which he referred to what seems to have been the 19th century preacher's favourite text, the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what he had to say. It is worth noticing that there is a difference in the beginning of the two gospel accounts of the Sermon on the Mount. According to St Matthew, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. According to St Luke, he said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit of St Matthew answer to the meek of Isaiah. Now, we must not go away with the notion that one of these meanings is right and the other wrong. Rather, by comparing them boldly together, we may find more exactly the full meaning of scripture. The Hebrew word in Isaiah means both poor and also meek, but mark this, it is especially used when it is wished to speak in one word of those who are both poor and meek. By the poor is not meant simply those who are in want of money or other property, but all who are in any way depressed or beaten down or low in any way, whether by what we commonly call poverty or by cruelty or tyranny or some other sore burden. In 1868, after years of preaching in the accustomed way on single texts, Hort decided to change tack and to deliver a series of sermons on the Bible as a whole. He wanted to deepen his congregation's understanding of the Bible, and he had concluded that sermons on single texts had, as he put it, one great disadvantage. They helped to keep up that mischievous notion, which is everywhere so common, that the Bible is nothing but a collection of texts in which we put our hand and draw out in a random way whatever we please without troubling ourselves to think where it came from. And many of the most precious truths of the Bible are not to be found in any text at all. They come into our minds only when we think of whole chapters and books together. Well, Hort devoted 12 sermons to a systematic introduction to the contents of the Bible. When he left the biblical world to return to the present, he tended to dwell on psychological or religious difficulty. For example, the weariness that comes with unchanging sameness, and in a Good Friday sermon, the difficulty attendant upon aligning one's moods with the solemnity or thankfulness appropriate to the church's seasons. He says, sometimes feeling how difficult that is, we give up the attempt and rest in a half sullen and unprofitable gloom and long for the day to be over. Although Hort's sermons also contained some of the conventional pieties of his day, there is sometimes a note of shocking honesty which marks him out from many of his contemporaries. Edward Behrens, on the other hand, is an example of a preacher at the other end of the spectrum from Hort. Behrens, who was born around 1777 and died in 1859, became Archdeacon of Berkshire, and he produced six volumes of village sermons between 1820 and 1852. He described his works as of the humblest description whose only object was to impress upon the hearts and consciences of a village congregation plain and acknowledged truths, with reference especially to practical effects which those truths ought to produce. Barron's desire to stress practical effects may account for his relative lack of attention to biblical sources. His 26 village sermons are strongly hortatory, with only seven being intended for the seasons of the Christian year, and the other 19 being concerned with themes relating to conversion and Christian behaviour. His sermons warned repeatedly of the danger of hell and being only interested in religion when ill or facing death. 
Titles include Conversion on Turning to God, Deathbed Repentance, Time is Short, The Folly of Being Wicked, The Government of the Heart, Behaviour in Church, and my favourite, On Joining Audibly in Public Worship. The sermons have been arranged in a way which would make them a logical sequence for a reader in search of a course of instruction on how to be saved. Barron's thesis was simple. This change or conversion is absolutely necessary in order to our being received into heaven. And consequently, since there is no middle state, it is absolutely necessary in order to our escaping the punishment of hell. The sermons were certainly not devoid of biblical material. His sermon, Time is Short, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 to 31, goes into some detail about the Corinthian church. And his sermon on zeal, Galatians 4, verse 18, begins with an explanation of the Galatian context before warning of the dangers of lapsing into formalism. But in treating many themes, Behrens was completely focused on his contemporary situation and used biblical allusion simply as a form of seasoning. For his sermon on joining audibly in public worship, he took as his text Romans 15 verse 6, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He complained that in many congregations, the voice of the minister is heard, but in many instances it is responded to by the voice of the parish clerk alone, the rest of the people preserving the silence and stillness of sleep. But equally, he wanted to discourage ostentatious parades of devotion, lest the congregation become like the hypocrites praying on street corners, a reference which deftly moved the context from Shrivenham to the Gospel of Matthew. Well, if Hort and Behrens represent two very different sermon styles, other preachers tended to switch back and forth between the Bible and moral exhortation, although there is much more work that could be done in order to analyse how this process occurred. William Jackson, curate of Bodel Street Green in East Sussex, tended to heap biblical passages upon each other, producing a florid weaving of texts. He also tended to move readily from his text, in this example, Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, to imaginative descriptive passages, in this case the Garden of Eden, and then to a contemporary message of social conservatism. And this is what he has to say. Adam laboured, and you labour. But Adam ate freely and without restraint, whereas you are often compelled to eat sparingly. I dare say it seems sometimes very hard that you should turn the stubborn soil, preparing it with much labour for the precious seed in its season, your children gathering out the noxious weeds, and again at harvest time should reap the ripe corn and store it in the barn for another, seeming yourself only to have a scanty portion for your toils. Does this seem hard, my brethren? Would your own heart sometimes persuade you to believe what wicked men would teach you, that this order of human society is unjust and wrong? Let not your own too easily perverted hearts let not any subtle teacher of evil persuade you thus to, da to doubt the ordinance of God, who has appointed by his divine providence the various ranks of men, and declared in his sacred word that the poor shall never cease out of the land. The overwhelming majority of the sermons that have been studied here have as their primary purpose exhortation and warning. Hort was scathing about this type of preaching. He said, there is no congregation in the whole church which needs nothing but warning and exhortation. All need teaching likewise. 
It is not enough to be told what we should feel and think and say and do. We want to have the story of God's wondrous dealings with men in past times impressed on our minds. And many of us will never be able to do this unless it is explained to them. But for theologians le less gifted than Hort, it was always easier to condemn and threaten fornicators or thinkers of impure thoughts, something which Behrens did in virtually every sermon, rather than to explain how the various parts of the Bible interrelated. Well, in this talk, I hope I have persuaded you of the popularity of the printed village sermon and its extent as a distinct preaching genre. These sermons were preached in their hundreds of thousands and published in their thousands over a period of about 100 years. Although they required from their audiences a solid knowledge of biblical stories, they were intended to be simple forms of communication, whether they were read or heard. What Robert Ellison has described as the ornamented oral rhetoric of the 17th and 18th centuries had given way to a plainer, more natural, more literary approach to sacred speaking. Among the theological elite, like Hort, the continuing ability to write plainly in clear, sparse prose was demonstrated through the publication of his village sermons. It indicated that although the author's natural habitat might be the university or the cathedral, he had still believed it important to communicate with rustic audiences and had believed in upholding the village community. The sermons reveal the village clergy as being, and in this necessarily limited sample, with the very notable e uh, exception of Hort, an autocratic body, rectors in the ancient sense of rulers, maintaining a somewhat unrealistic vision of rural unity in which they were themselves at the centre. They preached a message based on salvation by faith, expressed through unwavering self-discipline and good behaviour. It is a world of bridled tongues and patient forbearance, of continual watchfulness and temptation lurking at every turn. And it's very striking how seldom the love of God is mentioned. A village congregation was more likely to hear a themed sermon on sloth or signs of declension in religion or the reward of forsaking all for Christ than anything relating to the liturgical year. In those cases when it is possible to be certain of the day on which the sermon was preached, it is striking how infrequently preachers preached on the readings laid down in the lectionary printed in the Book of Common Prayer. And this raises the question of whether they actually read the appointed lessons or substituted their own readings to fit their sermon. No evidence either way has been discovered on this, although the very strong strictures which existed concerning the full and correct use of the prayer book would make the abandonment of the appointed readings seem unlikely. If this is the case, then it must have been that the sermon was seen as a freestanding item and no attempt was made to relate it to the readings or the calendar. That was not thought necessary. Finally, it is apparent that preachers who were mainly concerned with warning the congregation about their eternal fate, such as Gresley and Behrens, had no obvious interest in lectionaries or liturgical seasons. Preachers like Hort, who had followed F.D. Morris in rejecting the doctrine of eternal damnation, were more likely to have what would be seen as the modern approach of linking preaching to the set readings and the liturgical seasons. Nevertheless, Hort's approach to the lectionary was hardly slavish. In Lent 1861, he devoted three Sundays to the temptation narrative in Matthew 4, which had been the Gospel reading for the first Sunday. In 1858, he preached on Romans 5, chapter 8, on Good Friday. In 
and on 1 Peter 1 verse 3 on Easter Sunday. R.W. Church's 1899 collection, Village Sermons Preached at Wakeley, contains 37 sermons in total, of which 23 were preached on identified Sundays and holy days in the calendar. But only seven of the 23 used that day's lectionary readings, so even impeccable tractar tractarians like Church seemed little bothered by such matters. And even in his Easter Day sermon, Charles Hartley's message remained joyless and depressing. Snare succeeds to snare, and temptation to temptation. Like the waves of the sea, no sooner is one passed than another approaches. As we have seen, the majority of village sermons are thematic, free-floating compositions, which did not require to be preached at any particular season. Sub-themes such as tidiness or punctuality sometimes make an appearance. They had little obvious connection with Christianity, but much to do with ensuring good order in 19th century society. And so the village sermon has much to tell us about how the understanding of what constitutes a Christian life has changed in the intervening years. <laughs>